joining. If you're watching the recording, you missed it all. But here's your chance to catch up. Here we go. What is digital transformation? The word digital is a synonym for the pace of change that's occurring in today's world, driven by the rapid adoption of technology. The word transformation in this context is how an organization is built to change, in, innovate, and then reinvent rather than simply enhance and support the traditional methods. Digital transformation does not mean more technology, more communications. It means changing our organizations, transforming it for the customer, transforming the internal workings in order to maximize the benefit that comes from technology. This is what we believe. We believe that the competitive advantage is created at the strategic planning stage. And that's why it's really important. People and our culture of innovation is what's going to sustain it. And technology and communications is, of course, the means by which it's delivered. But I ask the question, do we spend too much time on and cash acquiring new technology and new websites and platforms and communications tools when actually competitive advantage is won earlier on in the strategy planning stages? So if we're to plan out our roadmap, and look at our strategy, where are we going to start? Well, the big picture is this. There are major road blo change blocks that need to be uh, understood when we're dealing with digital transformation projects. They are strategy and culture. The idea of having um, our strategies parted from our culture is actually not going to work. Or any good strategy that fails, fails because the culture of the organization isn't right at the time. Quite often, the cultural issues are resolved by good communications and having processes for innovation. Many people think that they are innovative in their work and want to be innovative in their work. But actually, it's creative. They're simply being creative. They're not innovating because the innovations are not solving the strategic challenges, usually because there isn't actually a strategy or a proper roadmap. Technology is then used, of course, to implement our innovations to help us achieve our strategic goals. And the data and analysis proves whether or not it's working. So let's take a closer look at where we would start on point one for strategy at the very, very beginning. I want to introduce you to this Ionology strategy quadrant. It's something that may, if you've watched any of our videos, you'll see it coming up time and time again. Um, this is something we've invented several years ago. It's academically peer-reviewed, tried, trusted and tested. It is the most referenced method for digital transformation online and it's used by hundreds of organizations, taught and published in my soon to be published book by myself and Professor Mark Durkin, the Executive Dean at Ulster Business School. So please place your pre-order on our website, that's live now. Anyhow, you want to know what value there is in this. I want to put it into the context of a case study. This is my friend, Erin. She runs a very uh, interesting business that's involved in the creation of uh, intellectual property that sits inside a mobile device. She realizes that when she is in this position that as the mobile technology world is changing, her business must change too. She needs to restructure the organization in order to be able to leverage the new technologies that are coming on board and to constantly evolve. She needs to be able to bring her team with her and she wants to know how she's going to do that. Right now, in, in, when Erin takes a look at her business, she notices that she, her business is in the cold rational space at the bottom because her customer, the, the y-axis is how your customer perceives you. Cold and rational does not mean bad. It simply means that the customer sees you as a utilitarian need. If they could get another one cheaper, they'd go elsewhere. Mild and informed means that she has value to the customer that goes beyond price but still it's not too far beyond price there are points of differentiation they trust her they like what she does uh, she's perceived good at what she does but it's not enough that if a new technology came in it wouldn't sideswipe her business out of the way warm and comforted is when you are seen as the innovator and hot and passionate means you've invented something that is just a must-have as you move from cold and rational up to hot and passionate the major difference is the price you can typically charge. Hot passionate products like our iPhones, for example, we are charged $600, yet the creation of them costs less than 100 How come? How can this be? We will pay such an enormous amount for something in such a competitive marketplace. So the challenge that many businesses have is understanding where they are now and where it is that they would like to go to. Because she sits in this yellow square of advocacy, she's in a niche, she actually finds that the web traffic to her website is quite low. It is a common characteristic of advocacy. Advocacy 
this yellow box means it's where the starting point where most organizations are before they go on their digital transformation journey. And the low traffic is simply an indication of how she does business. Advocacy. She has people recommending her. They go out, they shake hands, they do the deal, and that's the deal done. But the business doesn't expand very well that way. And the reason is because growth profiles of advocacy-based businesses are quite low. Erin wants faster growth. So she can move to the attention square, which is, as we'll see, around buying media, getting advertising, sponsorship, turning up at trade show events. Or she can move to the authority square. The authority square is very interesting because she's now building a brand based on innovation. And those brands tend to get substantially more traction than brands that are just paying for the advertising. And then there's the prime brands, the big 800 pound gorillas that sometimes exist in your marketplace, sometimes not. So she's the decision to make as to where it is that she would like to move from and would like to move to. There are characteristics that are going to be controlling in each of these circumstances. If she goes from advocacy across to attention, the big challenge that the business will face is that she has to buy media. Attention is principally based on the idea that you will buy attention for those that are searching for what it is that you do. Advocacy, however, is based on your own media, email marketing, social media that are relevant for your channels. When she's cold and rational, social media plays no part in what she does. Most banks, most utility firms, tweets and Facebook and all it is is a bad complaints channel. The same thing would happen for Erin's business that the mobile phone uh, hardware vendors that she works with have no desire to engage with her on social channels. That's not unless she moves up. And how does she move up? Well, she has the choice to move to authority from this position in, or to attention or to stay in advocacy. If she wants to move to authority, she'll find that her entire profile of her web analytics and her big data will start to look very different to when it was when she was in advocacy. Why? Because social comes into play. Social and referral media. What do we mean by that? Well, people are now sharing what she has to say. Why would people want to share what she has to say? Because she's innovated. She's changing the marketplace. She's able to evolve her business. Evidence that what we are doing is innovative can only come from external assurances. In other words, if the customers aren't talking about us, you can be pretty sure it's not innovation. If the industry is not able to talk about us and the inventions that we're coming up with, it's not innovative. It may be creative, but not innovative. And it is innovation that creates authority businesses in existing niches or new niches. The challenge that Erin is going to have about moving to that direction is that it takes a lot of work. But when she gets there, it's the easiest way to come in and take a prime position. Quite often, businesses, the largest businesses in the room, the prime players, acquire authority businesses. So when she's making this decision as to move to authority, she has to be very conscious of the fact that she needs a clear vision of how the future will be, one that's different to now. She needs to be able to dominate a wave. We usually see new waves coming. In her industry, it's Internet of Things. It's machine learning. How can she innovate in that space and try to dominate a subsection or niche within it? She has to be able to say why the old is over and the new is here. And actually, many of her customers may be using the old. So this is a dilemma that innovators face. The innovation that quite often is technology enabled um, and she has to have the ability to break eggs. In other words, if you're going to talk about how the old is changed or is dying and how the new is coming along, it is likely you will face others who have a different opinion. This is what we refer to as breaking eggs, the ability to be challenged and to challenge. And in many organizations, that's not possible. She has to publish her ideas. They cannot remain secret within the organizations and that then needs to be referenced. Others crown your authority. You can't self-proclaim to be the authority. The traffic map starts to look like much referral traffic, starts to dominate your analytics, which is a further proof. And you must have a unique value proposition, which stays very closely in line with what it is that you're trying to dominate, the niche you're trying to dominate. Finally, she must invent 
constant cycles of innovation in order to create a unique value proposition. It's not easy innovating. It's not easy constantly innovating. It's not easy constantly innovating and then showing it to the world and hoping they'll like it and getting them to reference you. So while many businesses say they're an authority within their sector, the evidence quite often says, no, you're not. And the way and only way that she can map that out is to make sure that she's got the resources able and capable of leading to authority. But as we know, that authority profile is the quickest way to build a large scaling, sustainable business in the digital economy. So Erin is now faced with a choice. Which road does she take on this journey? Stay within advocacy? Which is fine. She'll be able to work her business and adapt to the changes she finds it and enhance her current proposition. Does she go for attention? The simpler but much more expensive option where she's buying attention. Or does she go for the long-term value but riskier move of innovating and becoming the authority but still runs the opportunity of getting the big bucks should they arrive? This is how we start many transformation projects. This is what will drive the debate as to whether or not it's something that we would like to do. We have the resources and then it allows us to diagnose the challenges that we would face if we took any of these roads. When we know the challenges that we face, we can then innovate to overcome them. And this is where innovation starts to play its part again. Folks, I hope that was enough for a Friday. If you're not watching this on a Friday, I still hope it was enough. I thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you.